This is making me feel comfortable already. If that's what would happen to me if I was switching. <laughs> 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 Taking this model apart for me. And if this was our normal me, the top part would be a perfect machining of the bone to accept a cap like that. The lower part would be the tibia. That's this, the base plate that goes in the lower half and becomes a person's new surface. One keeps their ligaments and all their muscles. We work between those to get to the knee and resurface the end of the bones. It becomes a perfect sizing and machining to take away those worn surfaces of the bones to cap them with an artificial surface. That's, in essence, what a knee replacement is. Think of it like a knee recapping or a knee resurfacing. And in the process, the ligaments and the muscles are severed? Correct. We Muscle has grain. If we work within that grain, we can split the muscles without cutting the muscles. That's one thing that we really evolve. It helps in the recovery from you. Okay. From, from like how many years ago? Well, it's still, 
I would say that's sort of led to the phrase minimally invasive of just about any surgery. Whether that's hip replacement or knee replacement or bunion surgery. That's the concept to be less invasive. Smaller cuts, but incisions that work within muscle without cutting muscle. Helps in the recovery. We work with this all the time. Right? So say things. 13 years ago it came out doing it. Certainly a little more. Yeah, because my husband had done both 12, 13 years ago. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon. There's not much. I'm not yeah. laughing at what yeah. he did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But he reminds me that they'll be laughing at me as well. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> but that is how we, okay. that is sort of part of the evolution. In my time of just doing hip and knee replacement since I came to Mankato, I consider all the things sort of a continuous evolution versus a revolution. We now use things like this for a higher degree of accuracy and precision. We can get places less invasively. We can use better anesthesia, better medications, other things that sort of help all the parts of the pie become better experienced. I still think knee replacement is a rather difficult recovery because it's a pretty sizable time commitment. But that being said, it just keeps getting better. So we can sort of ultimately replace what we originally thought. Is that actually it? That <laughs> That's it. sober? That's it's it. actually it. It's a plastic Ooh, model, but I'm going to pass these around <laughs> and you can see what they're like. Wow. It looks yeah, kind right? of heavy. Too. The it top is part heavy. is a certainly a heavier piece. This is made of, in all knee replacements, the top part is made of chrome cobalt, a, a type of metal alloy. And the bottom part is made of titanium. The plastic in between. Do you feel like it's like the plastic in between polyethylene? It's a very wear resistant material, and that's the bearing surface for which knee replacements are made. There has been a real evolution in the development of the parts in today's world. A lot of the parts that we use, I'm very much a believer in the future of knee replacement are all glue-free or uncemented parts because these parts allow our bones to grow into the parts to create a living glue that hopefully creates the longest lasting parts that we've ever seen. What do you think? Did you see this? Me? Is there any Body, Great question. The, question. the question I ask is there any uh, chance of rejection of the parts? Metal, such as this, is considered okay, inert so or not sort of reactive within the body. And lots and lots of research poured into it. Are people actually who are allergic to nickel or things with cheaper jewelry? Do they have any sort of potential problems with them? Anybody else have any questions at this point? So without getting too techno about the, um, the procedure itself, we're very proud of how this has sort of evolved and, and how this is done now. I think that computers, if you think about this, and electronics have almost entered every arena of our world. It's only logical to see how they change and they're going to continue to change how we in surgery and in medicine. Robotics tends to sometimes instill uh, the thoughts that this is Wizard of Oz and somebody's over here driving something and something's working over there. As it is now, that's not the case at all. Uh, we use robotic assisted surgery as a higher degree of accuracy for performing the sort of precision cuts, the fitting, the customization of the parts, the alignment, and how they all go together. It's quite simply, it's Lasers versus rulers. It's a higher degree of accuracy. And that's what robotics help us to do. So we're going to kind of show you. We have we've never done this before. It's sort of um, the presentation done, but hopefully it turned out okay. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll show you how it's done. We can show it after it's done. We can turn it through the slide. 
So, so if there's a recall on them, is that as big a deal if you have to accept the again? Well, I mean, there have been a number of recalls in the world of orthopedics. Uh, currently, there is a plastic recall, which effectively is a notification of people over a 20 year period for how we package the plastic piece between the parts. And what they discovered over time is that that packaging could potentially let air molecules in the package. But if it sat around a long time, it might make it less wear resistant. Another simple analogy, if I went to buy new tires, the tires that were made yesterday are going to be better than the tires that sat on the shelf for an extended period. Sometimes in medical prices, especially in different places in the world, they can put on shelf for 10 years. Common around here, but this is these are sort of recalls. I've dealt with a recall that involved a metal part, which was had much different implications. It depends upon the nature of this. These parts that we use right now have been widely, well, not as widely used, but certainly used a lot, hundreds of thousands since about 2006, 2017. Okay, so. So we got holes on what side. Okay. So what we do is we <laughs> So this is a sawbones model. So in a normal knee replacement, we're looking at about this much. That's where the cut is. Imagine the skin is here. So the cut is directly in front of the knee. We split the fibers and move the kneecap to the side. That's how we get to the knee. This is actually what we're looking at, just about this much right here in surgery of the knee. I don't mean to stand in front of you, but get out of the way. But again, if you think about that x-ray, what we're looking at is the ends of the bones that are very arthritic. It looks like marble when your knee is worn out. It looks like the shininess of a piano key. All the normal fluffy kind of cushion cartilage is worn away, and it's and it's just raw and shiny, kind of like a, a stone or something. It, it gets very marbly. And that's what it looks like. Traditional knee replacement at this point is, is done uh, with alignment guides, rods, and cutting jigs that help shape the position or shape the ends of the bones to accept this type of cap. It has a very unique geometry. We can use devices to size this in every plane to determine size and position for people. And traditionally, that's done with blocks and alignment guides. Orthopedics is, is kind of uh, body carpentry a little bit. Robotics help us to sort of get rid of that type of process and use computers to shape with a higher degree of accuracy and precision, precision the position of the parts, the size of the parts, the rotation. There's a lot of planes that we're dealing with. And it's... Um, it's a much higher order of, of accuracy. These are called the rays. Once we've done this, we put basically little antennas. In order to have a robotic assisted knee replacement, you have to have a CT scan or a CAT scan that perfectly sizes the, 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 the exact geometry of your bone, and that information is entered in a computer. That computer already knows exactly the size and shape and of that bone right there. We're just gonna show the computer now where that is in space. And that's done with the antenna. Can you see that, that there? That's how we start. 
First thing we do is we show the rotation of the hip itself. Okay. And we can start to mark the alignment of the limb. Are any questions that you have while you're doing this part? We'll tell them this is basically. Do bones ever like split when you're doing all this? Not this part, but there are cases that, that you have to be careful with things. We all have different bone quality. It's good. Mine is kind of. Accident. Well, there's different shapes and deformities, and as we age, all of our bone quality tends to get a little less, and it's uh, it's it's different when we sometimes are working with bone that's very hard or very dense versus bone that can be very osteoporotic or very coarse. It's again similar to wood itself. Mm -hmm. A lot of the same technology, Dennis. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Don't tell anybody, but a lot of things that the orthopedics get is from the dentists. Yeah. <laughs> they steal from the dentists all the time. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> we stole a lot of things from dentistry. So yeah. it's probably better to get it done sooner than later because if you've got more arthritis, well, that's a good question. People do something sooner versus later. Might make it even more difficult. Yeah, but there's a, there's a trade-off with everything. Yeah. I always think that our Original parts are our best. We should always get as many miles out of our original parts as we can because artificial parts do come with some trade off. They're not quite the same in all respects as our original, and there are potential risks to have these original. So, while um, certainly it's a concern, age, and risk, um, I still think people, you know, that the philosophy is best to sort of maximize to the point you can with the use of your originals. There are best parts. So, yes. Great. Thanks for asking that. Uh, I think Zach, who's in charge, that's his sole job, is to run this computer, but also to have all the literally thousands and thousands of parts here all the time. We make the, we have an infinite number of combinations. Every individual is different. Uh, of all the things we did today, everyone was different sizes. For example, there are four parts with knee replacement. There's the top part, which is the femur part. There is the lower part, which is the tibia. There is a plastic piece in between. And then there's the artificial kneecap. For this particular knee device, the femur part, there are the nine. Nine different sizes, ten different sizes. Of the tibia, same. Of the bearing surface in between, they go in millimeter progressive thicknesses. Thirty plus. Kneecap, again, at least ten. Every part is custom sized to the individual bone. And this does it with a higher degree of accuracy. So all those parts are available all for time. surgery all the time. Not only that, we do multiples a day, so they have to be deep with every one of them. So you can imagine the inventory of the hospital. We have about half the size of this one. Oh. For just off of that piece, just the knee parts. You prescribed early on and you put the kneecap to the side as you're getting, Correct. exposing what you're working on. Then you, you replace that knee pad? Right, so we use again this plastic model would be the front view of your knee. This would be the outside, and this would be the inside of the leg. We split the fibers right along the inside and move the kneecap to the side, and that's how we get to the knee right there. And do the procedure that you're looking at right there. There's a lot of misunderstanding or myth 
about the kneecap. The kneecap, called the patella, right in the front of the knee, is the fulcrum that helps us extend our knee and gives us power. Oftentimes, people with a worn out knee on the inside and the outside also have a worn out patella. We shave the back surface of the kneecap and replace it with an artificial surface. That would be this. Okay. So if you had a knee replacement, you can feel the outside is your bone. Mm -hmm. It's the undersurface. This is actually a real part. Okay. Check it out. That's the kneecap or the kneecap replacement on the undersurface. So all surfaces that touch each other are replaced. A lot of misunderstanding about the kneecaps. Okay, so we've registered this person now. We can now, if you can see, we can move the knee throughout space. And we can get the exact alignment of the person's knee. And see that number up there in the right hand corner is about 90 degrees of flexion. And we straighten it out, that's zero. And it's in neutral alignment. And we can basically measure every one of these. We can measure the position if we want to put it back straight, which is what we want to do. Right there, Jack. Yeah. Okay. And then, we can, and then we can measure the outside, the medial side. There you go, Jack. We can measure a person's ligament stability. Lateral and their ligaments in flexion. And what we do when we do that is everybody's limb is a different alignment and different ligaments. Some people are very stretched out outside of the knee, or very stretched out ligament. They're not always perfect balance. But we have to correct all that in order to make a knee work smoothly. And so once we've done that, you got all that? Yep. Okay. Once we've taken all the measurements of the position, now we can size and adjust the parts in any way that we want. A perfect measurement of what they are based upon the person's CAT scan. That computer knows now where that knee is. Now we can begin, now's the thinking part of the operation. We can measure what size it is, what the balance of the ligament. We can, we can almost give a receipt of what you know, started with, but this is what we're going to try to reproduce. What do you need? Oh, I'll bring it in. You got it all? Okay. Now it gets cool. Well, <laughs> this is what you want to see. It's a bit, that's a preview. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, sure. Oh, it's good. Well, thanks, but this part we're really proud. Super cool. <laughs> Because we do a few, uh, we're sort of afforded kind of the latest and greatest in what's being developed in software technology. So we like that. This is like to refer to this kind of parking stall. So they drive in right along. All this is all done, of course, very sterilely, and it's all kind of down and grapes and all these types of things. But once we've done that, we can bring this in. Sure, you're on your feet all day. Sure, you had to take a baby from all the standing. I get a recorded tape of that. Because I like this little cushion thing you put on the floor. Like, hey, where's that pet? <laughs> okay, so you guys got it. So this is what we looked at. This is what we look at every day. And so you can see here's the saw blade. Can you guys see that? Oh, that saw that? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> right. So now when we push this button. That's the exact position that we determine that's going to be able to cut that. See how I moved it there? I'll move it out of the way. Okay, I'll bring it into the haptics, we call that. Here comes the saw blade. Now it's close. We'll pull that trigger, and then it moves it right where it needs to be. So it's green. So then we can cut.
bit different on sawbones. <laughs> so once it's done that, I'll show you what that looks like. So it perfectly machines the part in the exact position that we want to take off two millimeters on the inside and six millimeters on the outside in order to make that bone perfectly, that cut perpendicular to the long axis of this bone. That might seem easy, but all of our legs are different sizes. And so when you're looking at this much of the bone, it can be difficult to not get this like this or like this. But that's where, again, robotics allow us a higher degree of accuracy and precision. So is there blood when you're doing this? Or is <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought that'd be a little much for the presentation. So we want to keep everybody I mean, upright there for there the day. A lot of blood? I'll or? put my hand in there and show you. <laughs> Actually, it's not. We, there's actually very little blood loss during the surgery. Mm -hmm. Most of this with a tourniquet. A tourniquet is just a tight band that reduces its blood flow. And bones have, the bones have blood flow too. Uh, but there's a, there's a difference when we do it, but there's not a lot of blood loss <coughs> during surgery at all during the year of high school. We have pretty, pretty good luck. Is there a vacuum on the saw? A vacuum? Well, it's it's not quite like this, but it's uh, you have sort of a little bit of bone debris from surgery when you're working with bones, and we irrigate during the procedure. It's like a sterile saline that provides a sort of a cleansing agent. Yeah. So, I mean, your blood vessels are more behind, right? Right. So the there's lots of sort of dangers all around. Yeah. Uh, from ligaments on the sides to vessels and nerves behind, and, and so all that's an important part of this. If you go back to the other picture, or I can just move it in. Yeah. Um, well, the femur, the femur's fine. Back to the top of the femur up there is fine. Yeah. So one thing that, you know, we're observing all that during the time, but those, those, those lines that you see are called haptics, and it won't, it won't let me go outside of it. I can't, I can't even move outside it. So we can mitigate risk. So you couldn't way. just like accidentally bump it. can't it. go wrong. Yeah. Right. That's exactly yeah. right. But nonetheless, we that's you know this job and all of our jobs, we have to protect those structures. But this is a very proprietary thing, these haptics of controlling that in space and, and very uh, part of the sort of development of this type of surgery. So once we've done that, we cut the other ball. It's the femur ball. If I push it a little bit too deep, it gives me a little yellow. Blue is the real thing. change a, a saw it creates the last two angles of the cut. Little um, well we'll just show you we have the again it's it's kind of a it's a, it's a different type of shape. We create all these perfect sort of shapes with this. We're cutting the ends are called the distal cuts with this.
where that was done with sort of blocks and pins and rods and guides and shims. Now, you of all that sort of invasiveness and you create these perfect sort of shaped bone, excuse me, Jerry, to fit highly, highly precision that part. So you just, you just guide the depth? Well, I control the depth. We control the position, but it it, it it is that blue is basically we just want to shade the blue. The uh, one part of the, and that other screen, when you talk about the robot, Dr. Swanson enters all of the information as far as those adjustments that he made before uh, telling the robot what he wants, and then the robot is able to do that. It's not it's not the other way around. Uh, he determines how tight and how loose and by the resections that he made initially. Uh, that's done at the time of surgery. Then we, we put trial parts in. We can trial the position. The robot has made the alignment virtually perfect. 0.5 degrees of slight valgus, and we could, we could even correct that if we want. We can test the knee throughout an arc of motion. And that's how it works. Once we've trialed all the parts like this, we're going to say, that's good. Then we can now open each of those individual sizes and implant the real ones. So that's basically how it works. So you're kind of thinking on your feet. And, and the, I mean, you basically, you've got to know how much, but you still have to kind of try it out and see what happens. Yeah, but we can simp the beauty of the robotics is we can instead of making all these cuts and seeing if we were right, we can test all that before we do anything. Its level of precision is so much closer before we even start. A question for you or maybe Zach. Well, this is expensive stuff. Toy. Is there any redundancy? Yeah. Your post on the grips? Oh, sure. Like, I mean, it, it's a no, that's a very good question. Well, you're you're device, dependent on this. I'll say a thing yeah, blows a fuse in the middle of the deal, yeah, and you're out of luck. Yeah, the mm -hmm. bridge down. Right. Well, for the first 18 years, and still the vast majority of people in the United States still do all this conventionally, and we could do all that. But that actually has never happened. We did 1,048 today. Again, it, it doesn't change the operation from the basic principles of what's being done. Just allow us again to do this with a tremendously higher degree of accuracy and uh, less invasiveness. And we're trying to make patient satisfaction with both of your placement is very high. We're still trying to push that number closer to 100%. There's still a certain population that are unhappy with this. How can we make that better? That's what we're constantly trying to do. Make it better. Take out the outliers. Do you use the robot when you do the hip surgeries? We have. It still, I think, has some development uh, travel before the pain outweighs the gain. Okay. We have to put these trackers in, in in places that are outside of the normal incision. So there's some there's some give and take, and I think right now that some of that we can do without having the trackers and without having separate incisions. So there's a couple things that I'd like to see change and be developed where it becomes sort of standard issue but it gets back to the point where this is very expensive technology unless you're doing a lot a lot a lot of something uh this technology doesn't become available i think this robot alone costs a little over a million and a half dollars for the hospital but again what it's done for us for the community for patients has been invaluable and you know, we're fortunate to have a sort of center of excellence here that we can get the new replacement and can utilize this technology and hopefully not only that, move it forward. But people that 
come here to, to learn about it, to teach, to you can work. So. There's different brands of knee pucks, just yes. like tires and yep. different brands. Is there any big difference between them, the material they use, or sure. what? Yeah. Now there's maybe four or five major manufacturers of, of knee and hip implants for that much in the world. We've used them all. Um, I think that there, the honest answer to that is that there are some in different areas that may have a little bit of a competitive advantage for for some things than others, but basically they're all the same materials <laughs> and, and just a little bit of sort of change in geometry and insertional equipment. This company particularly leads the way in robotics. We have two robots here, but this leads the way in robotic technology. No denial. Three-dimensional printing has really led to an explosion in these parts from all the companies. So this continues to be kind of an avenue of development. But how do you check the uh, top metal plate later? Uh, the, uh, there are two ways for which these parts can be attached. Okay. Number one is still the most common way. In, in the United States is glue. So the parts got, that came from the dentist, I'm almost sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the parts, they're machined like we showed you. And then there's a bonding agent called methyl methacrylate. It's like bone cement. And it goes on and it, it adheres these parts. The second way, and one of the fastest growing uh, areas, especially in knee replacements, are called uncemented parts are glue free. And if you put this part, which is the same part, but different back, it has a, if you put it under a microscope and looked at it, it looked like coral or like a grit surface that these, sur that these parts go really tightly onto the bone. We call that an interference fit. What we machine here is so precise that it's slightly larger than this part. So it goes on tightly. Again, body carpentry, we hit it on. That's the macro lock of the parts. And over about a six to eight week period, the body creates the micro lock by growing into the pores. I'm a big believer that that's the future because if we can create a living glue, that's gonna supersede or last longer than anything we've ever had before. That's the future. So either glued or uncemented. Now, some people's bone quality depends on which choice might be better. There are a lot of factors that go into deciding that. Do you know that before you go in? Do you well, have that knowledge or do you have to wait and see? Well, we go in with the knowledge that everybody's going to get a group remit because oh. we think that we oh. have great belief in that. Okay. But sometimes circumstances, the consistency of the bone, again, it can be, we get a very good sense about bone consistency and quality when we're working with them and cutting them. Just like home. So you get in an accident. And what breaks? Yeah. The bone above or below. Mm -hmm. um, we call that a periprosthetic fracture, meaning a break above the part, like up here. We see these about once a week. Or down here. No different than if you'd fall and not have a knee replacement. The only difference is it's a pretty characteristic spot where it breaks. The parts are stronger than bone. What do you think? Very cool. <laughs> That's the show. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. That's Thank the you. show. Yeah. Very good. Wow. You haven't done this us. kind of a demonstration before? No. No, we, uh, we, we do a lot of work, uh, us as a group, with these type of things where we're trialing new insertional equipment or software modifications and things, but never sort of for people to make it meaningful to not be sort of lost in the minutiae that make it meaningful to just see basically how it's done. Very worthwhile, thank you. Yes, sure. thank oh, you thank very you much. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fun for us too. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. How long is each I think how many times is this uh, shorter before this point here or just uh, varies from person to person? The question asked is how long is the recovery time for a knee replacement? Well statistically people see measurable improvement for one 
two thirds of the recovery is in the first three months. That being said, we get people up the same day the surgery, meaning it'll take full weight right away. It's the bending and the straightening that's difficult and kind of the gain in the first six weeks. Most people after six to eight weeks, they're, hopefully this isn't too much, they're not giving me a hug, but they're, they're realizing that, okay, the tough part is at least behind them. <laughs> Most people after six to eight weeks are starting to think about other things or getting on the golf course or getting back to work. But the first several weeks, uh, I always say whether your neighbor says it or remembers it or not, it's not, it's, 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 it's hard. I have great empathy for that because I think knee replacement more than any other operation in orthopedics, it takes a pretty sizable time commitment and, and you get out of it what you put into it. It's very dependent upon exercise and therapy. <laughs> Hip replacements, ah, usually you, you just about anything. You get on with life. But, you know, whether you're doing, but knee replacements really <laughs> require investment by people. They do, by and large, they really do. So do you have a free exercise program that you recommend? Still, yeah. statistically, the better shape people are coming into the party, the easier the recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And so, we have a, a free exercise program. I see some people that, that wish to therapy, but the mindset is anything that involves muscle tone building or flexibility stretching or walking aerobic things, anything that improves generalized conditioning helps people in the recovery. That's a fact. So biking would be good. Right up near the top. Okay. Biking and swimming I put so right up near the top. So even if you got hurt again, you're gonna have to replace them anyway. So <laughs> 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 I mean, right. you need a job? <laughs> Pros and cons of doing both at the same time. Okay, the question asked was what are the pros and cons of doing both knees at the same time? We do do that. I have for a long time. The, the only pro of doing both knees at the same time is half the recovery because you're doing the work of two at one time. That's the only pro. What are the cons? Uh, it's a little more work. Well, you can see that sometimes with one knee too. Again, the better uh, shape you are coming to the party, the easier the recovery. Most people after two knees, I tell this story almost daily too. Most people after they do two knees at the same time. Again, there are no wrong decisions because you will never know the difference. Most people that do two knees at one time say, oh, I didn't like it, but I'm glad I'm done. See you later. Okay. Most people do one at a time say, I don't know how those people do two at a time. <laughs> because it's not, it's not right or wrong. Sometimes people are in good shape and have two very bad knees and they're certainly highly motivated and they do very, very well. Sometimes doing one knee at a time, even if you have two bad knees, is, is sometimes the easier course. It's very personal and those are the kind of things I talk about with people. People say to me, oh, if I do one, I'll never come back and do the other. That's not true. The memory does have to fade a bit. Um, it takes some physical and mental stamina. About it. But they, I'm going to do the other. Pain changes the way you think. Nobody wants any surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Your biking comment up to the top was perfect. Uh, I bought a recumbent bike before I uh, became a new bike. And I was on that bike all the time. Best thing I've watched. I can almost tell. Uh, biking involves motion without impact loading. Same as getting in the water. Anything that kind of promotes movement and has some sort of diversion. And so that's why low impact exercise like biking <coughs> and swimming are second to nothing. Okay. okay, it's all it's down from the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I checked oh, out your okay. scar. Your father in '91. <laughs> 91? Oh, nice. 91. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah, you in 2015. Wow. <laughs> wow. We just we started the process. Wow. Yeah, and that's often the story of some preceding damage or cartilage loss. Similar to mm -hmm. if you go cut a piece of rubber off your tire, you'll drive away and think everything's fine, but mysteriously, it doesn't get 50,000 miles. 
We have a lifetime to get out of our parts. And so how we live and those injuries sort of add up over time. There's your sample of both knees at one time. There you go. Uh -huh. Are you glad? Yep. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Wait, I was two or two or one. Six weeks. Perfect. Is this like 19? 19 years. That's your story. <laughs> you did both shoes at the same time? Yeah. Same time. Same time. I'm here like you know. <laughs> well, we it's sure appreciate you coming. Yeah. It's nice to see you all. Yeah. Thanks for the kindness yeah. yeah. and coming and the interesting yeah. questions. Thank, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.